All right, can you please take your Bibles? You should be there in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And look at verse number 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 2. It says, set your affection. So I want you to notice that word affection there. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. So you notice that, you know, we all have affections. We all have, we would say the word feelings, or the term we often use is the word emotions, okay? And it says to make sure that, you know, we put our emotions, our affections, our feelings in the right place. That we obviously, in this passage, this verse, on the things above, on the heavenly things, the spiritual things, rather than putting all our feelings and emotions on this earth alone. Drop down to verse number five. Drop down to verse number five. It says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, remember we're not to have our affections on the earth, what kind of things comes out upon this earth? Fornication, uncleanness, notice the next word, inordinate affection, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now what does it mean to have inordinate affection? Obviously, all these things that are listed here and you're going on in the list, these are all wrong things to have. Okay, these are uh, sins that we ought not to commit upon this earth, sins that we ought to overcome in our earth, or, or, on this earth. But it says inordinate affection. Inordinate. What does that mean? Well, think about the word inordinate. You know? Now, we've got the prefix in there, and that's a, that's a negative prefix, inordinate. Now, think of the next word, ordinance. That sounds like order, right? So it's, it's, it's contrary to things that are in order. All right? You know, we would use the word disorderly. We don't want to really use inordinate. Uh, inordinate, we would use the word disorderly. Okay? So when we talk about our affections, inordinate affections, our affection, when we think about something being in order, we believe, you know, we understand it being in the right place, in, in the right framework, right? In, inordinate affection is the opposite. It's your emotions, it's your feelings, it's your affections all over the place. Okay? Not within certain boundaries, not in order. Okay? And we would, uh, the word inordinate, if you just looked it up in the dictionary, it means large, excessive, or unrestrained. Obviously, it's not in order. It's, it's unrestrained. It's breaking out of those boundaries. And so what we read there in verse number 5, inordinate affection is something that we are to overcome. So when we think about that, when it comes to our feelings or our emotions, when you have excessive, out of control, out of, you know, unrestrained affections, this is something that God wants us to fix in our lives. And so the title for the sermon this morning, brethren, is Learn to Control Your Emotions. Learn to Control Your Emotions. Now, when it comes to children, it's very easy for children to lose their temper. You know, little babies, they, they, they start to cry about every little thing, right? Uh, you know, a, a little child takes another child's toy and they're bawling their eyes out. It's like the end of the world as far as their emotions go. Obviously, if I took something that you wanted to have and I took it off you, you get a little bit upset, but you're not going to start bawling your eyes about it, right? It's not going to be the end of the world for you. But, you know, this is something that children need to learn as they mature, as they grow. Not only are they growing physically, uh, not only are they growing with knowledge, but they also need to learn how to control their emotions. This is why it's important sometimes for parents to just pull out that rod, that rod of discipline sometimes when your children are having temper tantrums, you know, they're losing it, you're taking them to the shops, and they want something at the shops, and you say no, and they start to lose it. But I mean, you've, got to, you've got to teach them. And sometimes many of the ways that you can, the only way to teach children is to take out that rod, is to take out that belt and, and correct them, okay? This is part of the learning process. God wants us to learn to control our emotions. Now, when it comes to the term emotion, I looked up the, a definition, I looked up many different definitions for the word emotion, and this definition is the one that I, I liked the most. Let me read it to you. Uh, it was from dictionary.com, but the definition is, an effective state of consciousness in which joy, sorrow, fear, hate, or the like is experienced. It said, an effective state of consciousness. Now, it keeps going. It says, as distinguished from cognitive and volitional states of consciousness. Okay? So, it's different from cognitive or volitional states of consciousness. So, that goes over my head a little bit. Let me explain a little bit to you. Okay? When we talk about volitional, you know... Uh, we talk about, you know, that's where kind of the word voluntary comes from, volitional. Um, it's kind of like you make decisions or you do certain things just because you want to. Just because, you know, it's your preference. You know, you, you might make, be making a decision, where do I go for lunch today? And you say, well, I prefer having a bit of Indian today or something, right? I prefer having some Mexican. It's just, just, your, it's just your, your wants. It's just your, your personal preferences. You make certain decisions just because you want to, all right? There's nothing wrong with that in of itself. You're acting upon your own will. All right, no one's holding a gun at your head. You know, it's your own will, it's your own preference. That would be volitional um, state, a state of consciousness, okay? 
So when we talk about these different areas, these, these are um, decision makers for us, you know, uh, or, or responses to certain situations that, that we would then make a decision and move forward with that decision. So you've got these different things. You've just got what I want to do, my, my personal preference. When we talk about your cognitive state of consciousness, cognitive, that talks about your intellect, okay? Your intellect. It's a decision based on reasoning, on logic, on learning, on experience, okay? It may not be what you want, but you know it's the best thing to do because of, you know, it's going to have the best outcome based on what you've learned and what you've understood. You know, it's not your personal will. You may have to give up your will to make a cognitive decision, right? It's just, it's just the best. It makes sense. You know, you've, you've reasoned out, even though it's not necessarily what you want to do, it's the best decision to make. And then we have, well, we talk about emotions when it comes to that. Well, as I read there, it says an affective state of consciousness. Now, when we look at Colossians chapter 3, we looked at emotions being referred to as aff affections affections. That's where the same kind of idea went, right? It's the uh, affective state of consciousness. These are decisions that are driven by feelings, by your instinct, by your mood, by your emotions. You know, many times you're going to make decisions because of your emotions. And there's nothing wrong with that in of itself. You know, the best decisions to make is to take all three elements of your state of consciousness, okay? What you want, you know, what, you know your rational self and also your emotions, and, and make a decision based on all these things. That, that's perfectly fine. Okay? There's nothing wrong with making decisions because of emotions. For example, I might be fearful, that's an emotion, I might be fearful that my, a child of mine might burn themselves in the kitchen. I might be fearful that a child of mine might go to the kitchen drawer and pull out a knife and hurt themselves. And so I'll make a decision. I'll say, look, child, you know, whatever your name is, you know, you're not allowed in the kitchen. Right? I mean, that, that would be a decision made in motion, but then it's also intellect, right? I mean, it makes sense. You know, you, you're, you're bringing forth a few different ideas there as to make certain decisions in your life. Let me give you a list of emotions as well. I've gone through online just looking at different lists of emotions. You know, a lot of us believe love is an emotion, but it's not really an emotion, okay? It, it may contain emotions, but see, a lot of people make the wrong decision when it comes to love because they feel all butterly, you know, butterflies and, and wonderful for a moment with that person. I, I love them. And then you lose those feelings and it's like, well, do I love them anymore? You know, lo love is not just the, these feelings of emotions, okay? You know, when you get married, yeah, you know, I, I hope you marry the woman that you love or the, for a lady, the man that you love, okay? But there's going to be times in your life, in your marriage, that you're not going to necessarily feel love, but you're still to love your spouse. Whether, whether you feel those emotions or not, you're, you know, love is more of an action. But it can, of course, carry emotions. And, uh, you know, some lists of emotions are obviously happiness, uh, the thought of, of caring, well, that, that could draw out love as well. Depression, inadequate, feeling inadequate, you know, amongst others. As I said, fear, confusion, hurt, anger, loneliness, remorse. You know, and, and under these categories, you can have many other emotions. If, if you think about all the different types of emotions someone can feel, you can, you can usually fit them under one of these categories, okay? Now, what I really want to teach about today is not that you shouldn't feel any emotions. You know, I, I've been told many times that you have no emotions. That's not true. We all feel, emo we all feel emotions. Or someone might say to you, you're overly emotional. Well, again, there's nothing necessarily wrong with being overly emotional, okay? I mean, there are times to be overly emotional, right? I mean, if, if my wife passed away, you know, don't you think it'd be a bit weird if I'm not, like, very sad about that? <laughs> you know, it's a time to sometimes express emotion to a high degree. But as I said to you, it's not about stopping emotions. It's about learning how to control your emotions. And unfortunately, we live in a society that has not learned this basic truth. You know, where, you know we have a generation of children being brought up where basically they, they get what they, what they feel like, okay? And uh, people, you know, parents are just too afraid to discipline their children. Parents are too afraid to direct their children and teach them to have their right emotional states. You know, mothers react to children when they, when, they, when they cry and they yell out and they demand certain things rather than teaching their children how to control those things. So you're not screaming out and demanding things when it's not appropriate. So there's nothing wrong or sinful about an, an emotion in of itself, okay? You know, the main reason, if you're still in Colossians, I hope. Look at Colossians chapter 3, drop down to verse number 6. It says here, For which thing's sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So what do we learn there in verse number 6? That God feels emotions. God can feel wrath. God can feel anger. We know God feels all these things, right? You know, God can be hurt. You know, by our actions, we can, we can definitely hurt the Lord God, you know. Uh, the Lord feels joy, you know. The, the, the Lord feels many emotions. You know, God created us to be emotional beings, 
You know, he's given that, us that instinct, those feelings, those, 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 that, that inner thought within us to make the right decisions at the right times, okay? Drop down to verse number 8, please. Drop down to verse number 8. It says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath. Now, some people think anger or wrath are sinful. But again, what do we see in verse number 6? The wrath of God, okay? So is anger and wrath sinful? No. But if you're angry about the wrong things, if you're quick to anger, we'll soon see some of the passages about this, then obviously that's sinful, okay? There are times to get angry, and there are times to not get angry. There are things to, that, you know, God hates, and there are, there are the right time. Obviously, if, if you love what God hates, that would be, you know, expressing your emotions in the wrong way. You know, we, we understand that we ought to hate the things that God hates. We understand that we ought to love the things that God loves. When you have the right balance of these things, there's nothing wrong with those emotions that come out of the, in, in that situation, okay? Uh, so, again, verse number 8, it says, uh, be, uh, But now you also put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, out of your mouth. Drop down to verse number 12, please. Drop down to verse number 12. And of course, I'm not, going to, I'm not preaching through this whole chapter in any great depth. I'm just trying to show you that Colossians chapter 3 is, is a great chapter about emotions. Okay? We learn that God has emotions. Of course he does. Okay? Nothing wrong, sinful with emotions in of themselves. Verse number 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Look at verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And what series am I going through? I'm going through the perfect man series. All right. And so you notice that verse number 14 speaks about this bond of perfectness. This bond is the unity of the brethren. Okay? Uh, the Apostle Paul here is teaching the Colossian church how to be united. What is this bond? What's going to keep us together? Hey, what's going to keep New Life Baptist Church together? It's the bond of perfectness, which is charity, okay? And I said, you know, love in of itself is not an emotion, but yes, it is driven by emotion many times, okay? Or it produces emotions. And having the right emotions, having the right mindset, which drives us to love one another, is what's going to help our church remain uh, united together, loving, being able to forgive one another, because sometimes we're going to rub each other the wrong way. Sometimes we're going to disagree. Sometimes we're going to have little conflicts here and there, brethren, okay? But we want to have this bond of perfectness, charity, making sure that our emotions are in check and we're using them in the right way. Okay, let's keep going there in Colossians. Drop down to verse number 18. I, I, you, know, you know, obviously we, we know these passages, but I just want you to think about it from an affection point of view, from a feeling, an emotional side of things. Verse number 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, the feminist movement, they, they hate this verse, don't they? Wives, submit yourselves. This is what God commands. This is the Bible. You know, this is, what the, this is the teaching of God. Now, why would God have to tell wives, submit yourselves to husband, your husbands? Because automatically, within, you know, within every human being, whether you're a man or woman, you know, but especially in this sense for a woman, you know, you're going to have those rebellious thoughts. You're not, you're not going to want to submit under your husband at certain times. Okay. You know, you may not, as a, as a wife, you may not feel like submitting, right? You, you may not have those feelings, well, I, I just, I don't, I don't feel like submitting to him at this point in time. Well, what did we learn about the definition of emotions? It's the aff affective state of consciousness. You know what, whether you're feeling like submitting or not is, is irrelevant, you know? What else did we learn? The, the volitional state of consciousness, whether you want to. Well, I don't want to submit. Well, it doesn't matter whether you want to submit. It doesn't matter if you feel like submitting. Okay, this would come into the cognitive state of emotion. Okay, the rationale. Well, God tells me this is what I have to do. God tells me the best leader in the family is my husband. Okay, he's going to be the one that goes out and takes care of the family needs. He goes out and works a job, makes sure we have all that we need. You know, according to God, the man, the husband is going to be the best leader. And, and whether I feel like or not, whether I want to or not, I'm going to have to set those decisions aside and I'm going to just trust what God says. You know, many times we make decisions, it's not our will. We just have to submit ourselves to God's will. God, what do you have for my life? And, and, and for the lady here, the, the basic idea is this, ladies, is that when it comes to your husband, you know, the reason God has this for us, sometimes you make decisions because of your emotions, you know, and, and if you're not submissive to your husband because of your emotions, then your emotions are not in check. 
Okay, you're, you've not learned to control your emotions. If, if it's what you want or you desire, you know what? It, it, life is not about what you want or desire. You know, life is truly about serving others. You know, am I, the, am I the head of my wife? Absolutely. Am I the leader of my home? Yes. Am I the main breadwinner? Do I make the most important decisions for my family? Of course I do. But I don't do it just for myself. What do I want? You know, I'm often, most often thinking, what's going to be best for my wife? What's going to be best for my children? What is a God that you want me to do with my life? And you know what? Being a pastor of New Life Baptist Church and being a pastor down in Sydney of Blessed Baptist Church, I'm often asking the question, what's best for this church? You know, it's not what do I want? Boy, you know, I, I, I've grown out of that. I'm no longer that little two-year-old, you know, having tantrums. I want what I want all the time. And as we grow and mature, we, we, we learn to make, control those emotions, you know. We don't make decisions just because of emotions. And ladies, you know, the, the teaching here is that sometimes you won't want to submit because you don't feel like it or you don't want to. It doesn't matter, you know. You've got to base your, that decision on your cognitive state of consciousness which is your rationale, I read this in God's word, I know what God says, God knows more for what, what is better for me than what I know. You know, God knows better than what the feminist movement says, therefore I'm going to go with what God says. Regardless if you understand it, okay? You understand that God knows better than you do. And you say, well, Pastor Kevin, you always preach against the ladies. Well, no, I don't. <laughs> okay? right, here's the next thing for the men. Next verse, number 19. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 19. Husbands, love your wives. So of course, no, again, why does God have to write this in the Bible? Because many times husbands forget to love their wives. That's why. Okay? Instead, what you do, husbands, and be not bitter against them. Sometimes husbands, your, your natural response would become to become bitter toward your wives. Hey, you, you're now expressing the wrong emotions. All right? You know what? Even if your wife lets you down... You know, even if your wife doesn't meet up to the expectations that you want to, you're still commanded to love your wife. I don't feel like loving my wife. It doesn't matter what you feel like. Okay? This is not about what does my emotion, I've got to be driven by No, you've got to control your emotions. And if you're bitter against your wife, you need to overcome that bitterness. You know, your wives are going to fail you, husbands. And husbands, you failed your wives many times. And your children are going to fail you. And, and your pastor sometimes is going to fail you. And, and your brothers and sisters and Lord are sometimes going to fail you. You're going to just be bitter for the rest of your life. Now, God does not want that. You know, God does not want that in a marriage. It's going to destroy your marriage if you're holding grudges, if you're holding bitterness toward your wife. You know, it doesn't matter. I feel bitter. All right. Well, control your emotions. God says, don't be bitter against them. God says, love your wives. Go and show your wife. Go and tell your wife that you love her. You know, and this is why it's so good, men, even if you don't feel like it, even if your cognitive reasoning says, you know what, buying these $20 worth of flowers makes no sense whatsoever because they're going to die tomorrow. Well, sometimes it's worth just going and get that and showing your wife some love and saying, here you go, honey, here are some flowers. doesn't make sense to me, but I know this is an expression of my love towards you. Okay, I'm going to control my emotions, you know, and I'm just going to do what, what God says that I need to do. Drop down to verse number 21. It says, fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Now, some people misunderstand. Now, should, obviously, fathers, why, again, why is this here? Because we often will provoke our children to anger. You know, we won't show the necessary tenderness sometimes to our children. We expect more. You know, when it comes to my boys, you know, and we have some boys in this church as well. You know, if I see some of the boys in this church muck up at church, you know, it kind of annoys me a little bit. But if it's my children, it's going to annoy me a lot more. Right? Uh, obviously, with my own children, I'm going to be less patient with them sometimes, right? Because I have a, a greater expectation, of course. And, you know, we've got to be careful as fathers to not provoke our children to wrath. Now, some people read this and say, well, every time my child gets angry, I'm just going to give in to their anger because I'm not trying to make them angry. No, you just make them more angry. Like, they'll learn through life that to get my way, I just become angry. I just have a tantrum and I'll get my way. That's not what it's just teaching, okay? Let's keep going there. Uh, pr fathers, provoke your children to anger lest they be discouraged. You know, discouragement, that is also an emotion. Okay? And if, if fathers, if we're not tender with our children, if we don't teach our children the right methods, they can become discouraged. They can not have any motivation in life. You know, they feel like, I don't measure up to dad's standards, and why am I going to try? Uh, you know, I've had those feelings in my life. You know? And uh, I'm sure my parents are listening right now. Listen, I don't have, hold any bitterness. But let me just give you an example. I remember once uh, you know, I was in my math class, and I, I passed my math test, and I, I had the top grade in my class. I can't remember what he was, maybe 96% or something. Okay? I had the top grade. And I took it to my dad. And I, look, I love my dad, please. You know, don't, don't misunderstand. All right? But you know, I took it to my dad and he goes, yeah, but why wasn't it 100%? You know, I was like, dad, I'm the top of my class here. 
You know, instead of being focused on the 96%, my dad was like, well, 4%, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I, you know, honestly, as a child, I just felt, then why try? Like, like if, if it doesn't mean anything, then why try, you know? And so, you know, fathers, we've got to be careful, you know, and, you know, we've all done this. We've all, you know, driven our children to anger and, and discouraged them, and we don't realize that necessarily. But what are we trying to teach our children? We're trying to teach them to control their emotions as well. Okay, and so this isn't just okay. Every time your child gets angry, let them have what they want. No, teach your children to not get angry. That's the whole point. Raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Drop down to verse number twenty-two, please. Look at this. Servants, obey in all things your masters. This is your employer-employee uh, or employee-employer uh, relationship. Okay, obey all things. I don't feel like it. Well, that doesn't matter what you feel like. Okay, that's what the Bible says. Obey your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. All right, and, and I love the next part. But in singleness of heart, fearing God. Men, when you go to work, you ought to fear God when you step into that workplace. You ought to say, God is expecting me to work the best I can for these hours that I've been hired. I'm serving the Lord God. Now, is fear a sin? Well, of course not, because the Bible says that we ought to fear God. Now, should we fear man? No. You know, if you're fearing man, that's obviously sinful. But the emotion in of itself is not sinful because the Bible tells us to fear God. We ought to tremble at the Lord God. We ought to be seeking to please Him. We know that if we are disobedient children of God, that He'll step in and chastise us. He'll correct us when we do wrong. Hey, we ought to fear that chastisement. We ought to fear that judgment. You know, I'm not talking about salvation. Salvation has been paid for in Jesus Christ. But we ought to have a good, healthy fear of God in our day-to-day -day jobs that we do. And for ladies, it's your, it's your household or whatever it is that you do. Okay? For men, when you go out to work, fear God when you step into your workplace. Okay? So you can see this is a definitely about our affections, having our affections in the right place. Nothing wrong with fear as long as you fear the right th person, which is the Lord God. All right? Now, let's keep going there. Can you please turn... I think I'm out of, yeah, sorry, yeah, Colossians. All right, so we can move away from Colossians. Please turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, please. We obviously know the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. So I always like to turn to the book of Proverbs quite often when I preach, just to get some thoughts around, you know, what does God truly have to say about this? You know, if we, if we want to learn and grow and, and we understand, you know, we need to control our emotions, what does God have to say to, about our, emotional, our emotions, or if we lose control. Let's look at Proverbs 15, please, verse number 18. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 18. Now, this is the, the question about anger and, and wrath. Is it wrong to get angry? Is it a sin? A lot of pastors teach, a lot of churches teach that anger is sinful. Let's see what the Bible says here. In Proverbs 15, verse 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife. The Bible says, if you're a wrathful man, you know, you're known as someone that loses his temper and gets angry. You're going to cause strife. You're always going to have problems around you. You're always going to have conflicts around you. All right, so maybe Pastor Kevin, maybe anger is sinful. No, what's the next part of the verse say? But he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. So it's fine to get angry, but the Bible says be slow to get angry. Okay, you know, in other words, control that part of emo your emotion. We know that anger is something that is so easy to spark. You know, if you're just having a, a bad day and something doesn't go your way or someone cuts you off in the traffic and you've got the road rage. No, the Bible says be slow to anger. You might be fast on the streets, but when it comes to someone cutting you off, you've got to be slow to anger, okay? And it says being slow to anger, a piece of strife. It helps not create strife, okay? When people see you in control of your emotions, when maybe they expected you to lose it, you know, it's going to cause some peace and harmony, you know, be able to reconcile things and get things, you know, sorted between people rather than there being all conflicts and strife everywhere you go. So again, is anger or wrath sinful? No. Can it be sinful? Yes. If it's applied the wrong way, if you're quick to anger. But hey, if you apply it in the right way, hey, we ought to get angry about certain things. We ought to be angry about our sins. You know, the reason I go and discipline my children is that I get angry when they're disobedient to mom and dad. When they've done something wrong, I get angry. But listen, I don't go and discipline my kids out of anger, okay? I, I'm not just like, all right, let's just fix this up right now. I'm like, look, I get angry that they've committed such a sin. 
But then I know the right purpose, what God teaches, is then to teach my children, to chastise my children, so they, they don't make the same mistake again. You know, we, want, we don't want to be parents that lose our temper every time our children just do something wrong. We, yes, discipline is correct, but we ought to train them, teach them. Why was that wrong? You know, what should you have done in this situation? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Can you please go to Proverbs 27 now? Proverbs 27, verse number 19. Proverbs 27 and verse number 19. I like this verse. Proverbs 27, verse number 19. The Bible says, As in water, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. What is that saying? Well, the Bible is saying here, if you look into the water, it's going to show your face. You'll be able to see your face through the water. You know, sometimes, many times, it acts like a mirror in that sense. Okay? Well, in the same way that the water can show your face and act as a mirror, it says, so the heart of man to man. You know, when we talk about our emotions and feelings, we often talk about that coming out of our hearts, right? And, and you know, when, when we're out of control, when, it, when it, we, we, have our, we wear our, our emotions on our sleeves, and, and, we, and we lose it at certain times, it just shows other men the kind of person that you are. You know, if you're out of control in your emotional state, it's going to tell other people this person has no stability. This person is probably out of control in other places in his life. Hey, but if they see that you've got control of your heart, you've got control of your emotions, of your affections, what's that going to tell other men, other people that look at you? They're going to say, hey, this person's in control. This person's stable. Hey, this is somebody that I can trust. Okay, this is someone that I can share my concerns and worries to, potentially, because of how they demonstrate their emotions. You know, there are people that think, you know, you know being uh, hot-tempered or, or sh having their emotions on their sleeve, you know, shows people how strong they are. It actually shows you how weak you are, okay, because you're lacking self-control. You've got inordinate affections. They're not in its proper boundaries. It's not in its proper place. You think you're showing yourself to be strong, but everyone else around you knows this person's very weak. This person is very unstable, and they're not going to trust you, okay? So be careful of your emotions. The Bible's teaching us it's like a mirror. It tells other people the kind of person that you are, all right? Please turn to another proverb, Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25, please, and verse number 28. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 28. <clears throat> Proverbs 25, verse 28. The Bible says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Okay? Hey, if we don't control, if we don't have rule over our spirit or over, over our emotional, that's what the Bible space is teaching, right? Our, our feelings, our affections. If we don't control this, if we haven't got it in its proper boundaries, brethren, the Bible says we're like a city that is broken down and without walls. I mean, that, think about that, okay? Your life, God says your life is like a broken down city, no walls. So, you know, in what sense? Well, if you can't control your emotions, it's going to lead to your family being broken, you know, divorce and, and, and things like that, okay? Or, or, you know, just damaging the relationships in your family. You're, you're going to break it down if you can't control your emotions, your finances potentially could be broken because of your emotions. You know, making bad decisions because of your emotional state. You know, your reputation will be broken. You know, your productivity. You know, you producing whatever you need to produce, whether it's in the workplace or whatever job or hobbies that you're trying to do. Hey, that's going to be broken down because when you're emotionally out of control, you're not going to put your best work forward, are you? You know, you're not going to be able to think clearly. You're not going to have the focus to be productive in your state. You know, these are different areas of your life that will be broken down like a broken city. But not just a broken city. It says, and without walls. Without walls. Of course, we think about walls, we think about boundaries. Okay? We're trying to rule our emotions, our feelings within walls, within boundaries. Control your emotions is the title for the sermon this morning. And when you think about a city, especially in the time of the Bible, without walls, we're basically saying this is a city without strength or defense. Because the walls were the primary method of defense against, say, an invading army or something like that. Okay? And so what? You're saying that, you, yeah, like I said, someone that is overly emotional, it doesn't show their strength, it shows their weakness. It shows they haven't got the defense. They haven't got those walls built up in their life. You know, it basically says you're easy to cave in. You know, your, your walls, they're broken. It's easy for you when you're highly emotional to get into sins, to, to do things that are, are wrong, you know, and, and uh, this is... 
I won't go into it now, but you know, you just, again, make those wrong decisions in life. You haven't got that defense. You'll be influenced by the wicked world. You know, again, the, the walls are there to protect an invading army. You know, as Christians, we ought to be people with certain boundaries and defense. We know we live in a wicked world. We know we live in a very influential world, trying to turn our hearts away from the Lord, trying to turn our children away from church and Jesus Christ and, and, and the Bible. And we need to set up these walls of defense, you know, have the right emotional state. Otherwise, you're going to be easily influenced by a wicked world. Okay? And so Proverbs 25, yeah, I love that. Verse 28, you know, if you don't rule your own spirit, you're like a city that is broken down and without walls. So I hope you can see the importance. You know, yes, emotions are great. Thank God we have emotions. It helps us make good decisions in life as long as they are in control, as long as they are within the right boundaries, okay? But when, we, when they're not in control, we're going to be a broken down city. It can hurt our lives, hurt our relationships, etc., etc. All right. Can you please turn to... Uh, where can I get to turn to? Turn to Psalm 23, please. Turn to Psalm 23. Let me give you some other reasons that we ought to control our emotions. You turn to Psalm 23. Another reason why we ought to learn to control our, our emotions is because if we don't, brethren, we can grieve God. We can cause God grief because we've got the wrong emotional state. You know, one verse that um, we think about quite often is Ephesians 4.30, which says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Brethren, not only is our body purchased by God, not only does our body belong to God, but so does everything that takes place in this body. It's our emotional state, our feelings, okay? Sometimes we think our, our feelings, they're just, they're just mine. Nobody really knows what I'm feeling. Yeah, but don't forget the Holy Ghost is in, indwells your body. The Holy Ghost knows what you're going through. You know what? And if your emotions are out of control, or you're, you're, you're experiencing emotions in the wrong state, which is contrary to God's word, you're going to cause grief to the Holy Spirit of God. He owns you. The Holy, you know, your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. We ought to be mindful about what we do in this body, but also what's within this heart, what's within this mind, you know, or we're going to cause grief to the Holy Spirit. The, net, the second reason why uh, you ought to control your emotions, in fact, the second reason that I've got here is the main reason why I learned to control my emotions. Now, I'm, I'm never going to say that I never lose a bit of control sometimes, okay? I'm not, never going to say that. But generally speaking, people, like I said to you, people often say to me, you've got no emotions, but I, I do. It's just that I've learned how to control them, all right? I just, I'm, I'm not going to become very overwhelmed about certain things when I know I need to make an important decision, okay? But it was this here in Psalm 23, verse 4. Psalm 23, verse 4. It says, yea, we know this psalm very well. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Beautiful words. But look at verse number five. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. You know, one thing that um, growing up, especially as a teenager, you know, we all have, we all have bullies or... We, and sometimes you're a bully yourself, and maybe that's why you get a bully in return. Who knows, okay? But we, always, we tend to sometimes develop conflicts. We, 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 we meet people that don't like us, and maybe we don't like them, etc., etc. Again, it's a part of learning and growing, right? And uh, I remember just as a child, not wanting to give my enemies any satisfaction. Where they might do something that I don't like, and, and sometimes people don't, they, they don't really just want to destroy you or hurt you. They just want to get an emotional response out of you. And they rejoice when they get their emotional response out of you. Even in the, I've seen this in the workplace. You know, people, they just push your buttons. You know, they're, they're trying to find, where's that thin skin? All right? And they're trying to push it, trying to get you upset and frustrated because you're not doing things the way they want or whatever. Or just, you're just a Christian. You know, you're just a hard worker and maybe you're, show, maybe you're showing them to be poor workers or something and they don't like you, right? Just, I mean, that's just the world. People aren't going to like you. That's just how it is. And I realized, you know, just growing up, I, I never want to give my enemies any satisfaction where if they do something wrong toward me, I'm not even going to show them any emotion. I'm not going to show them any reaction. I don't want to give them it, even though it bothers me deep down, like, ah, you know, I want to get revenge, but I'm not going to show them that. Who cares? You know, that's honestly, like, people do something to me, I'm like, oh, okay, whatever, who cares? You know, <laughs> like, and, and uh, even though it did bother me inside, it's part of the learning process, growing, right? You're learning how to control those emotions, even though you're burning within. I didn't want to give my enemies any satisfaction. And, and even better, they're not giving your enemies any satisfaction. 
from an emotional response even better is being blessed by God in the presence of your enemies. Where, where your enemies, as it said in verse number five, they'll prepare us a, a table before me. Where, you know, your enemies are trying to hurt you and, and they're, they're waiting for that response. And what do they see? They see the blessings of God in your life. They see God preparing a, a table, a banquet, a feast, a celebration for you. You know, God, the Lord God anoints your head with oil. Your, your cup runs, runs over. You're, you're overly blessed. And your enemy's like, what in the world? We're trying to destroy this person. And they're having a great life. That's even better. That's a good way to rub things in your enemy's face, right? When they see you doing well. And, and it's the Lord that steps in that blesses you. Please go to another Psalm, Psalm uh, chapter 35, please. Psalm 35, verse number 19. Psalm 35, verse number 19. And there are many Psalms like this. I just pointed some of these out, you know. And uh, Psalm 35, verse 19, it says, Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me, neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. That's exactly it. I'm like the psalmist. God, these enemies, they're annoying me. These, 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 you know, these bullies or whatever it is, right? These co-workers, they're trying to make me angry and upset. They're trying to cause me to quit my job. They're trying to make me to fail, Lord. But you know, I don't, I don't want to give them anything. I'm just going to go buy a business and I'm just going to ignore them. And they're going to be like wasting their time trying to get that, that response out of me. And I'm not going to give them what they want. That's how I'm going to get back to my enemies. I'm not going to give them what they want. And when you read the Psalms, you'll notice this over and over again, the same desire from the psalmist. You know, please don't allow my enemies to wrongly rejoice over me. Why would an enemy rejoice over you? Because they got the response they wanted. And many times it's just that emotional response to lose control, you know, to, to uh, help, to make you lose focus on what you were trying to achieve in the first place. So that was my, I'm just sharing with you, that's my primary reason why I learned that I need to learn how to control my emotions. I just can't wear my emotions on my sleeve. I give my enemies too much joy when I do that. Therefore, I'm going to stop that part of my life. Another reason, of course, um, I'll just quickly read to you from... Uh, you, can you please go to... Uh, no, actually, hmm. please go to 2 Corinthians, please. Please turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. Another reason why you ought to control your emotions, as I already kind of covered, it hurts relationships. You can really hurt relationships. You know, if you just wear your emotions on your sleeve, okay? And, and it, uh, one of the verses that I, I love in the Bible is Ephesians 4.26. It says, Be ye angry. Hey, the Bible's commanding us to be angry. If you don't know that, maybe you should turn to Ephesians 4. Only, only, if, you, you, only if you don't trust me. Okay? <laughs> Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry. But then it says, And sin not. So it's possible to get angry, but not to sin. That's the commandment. Okay? God doesn't want us to get angry, and then out of that anger commit some sin. Yeah? God what says, okay, if you're going to get angry, that's fine. Not a problem, it's your emotion, but sin not. Then it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Then it says in verse 27, neither give place to the devil. All right. So listen, there are going to be times that you get angry, and you're going to get angry righteously. You're going to get full of wrath. Okay. God does not want us to then get out of control and go in and lose focus and, and, and make some stupid decision that's going to cause sin. No, the Lord God has a very clear commandment for us. Before the sun goes down, you've got to appease that anger. Okay, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And for those that are married, there are going to be times that you're going to get angry at your, your spouse, aren't you? It happens, you know, we don't always agree. We don't always see eye to eye. But you know what? Before the sun goes down, you better go and, and, and forgive your spouse. You ought to say, you know what? I'm not going to give into that bitterness. You know what? Let, let, we're going to put that aside for today. Right? The, the sun's coming down. I'm going to make sure that we go and make peace. I'm going to make peace between myself and my wife or a woman between her husband okay, and herself. We need to make peace. You know, and this is what God commands. If you're still holding a grudge next morning, you've disobeyed the Lord. You've gotten angry and you have sinned. God says, be ye angry and sin not. Okay? Then it said in verse 27, neither give place to the devil. So this is the problem. If you allow your anger to go to the next day, you'll give in place to the devil. The devil sees those broken down walls. You're not in control of your emotions anymore. To control your emotions in that point is to make sure you make peace before the sun goes down. Okay? You wait the next day, you've given the devil an opening, an opening to come and hurt and destroy your marriage. We need to make sure we control our emotions. It'll hurt relationships. And finally, the next point that I have, the reason why you want to control your emotions is because It'll cause you to make decisions that you'll later regret. I'm sure we've all done that. I'm sure we've all made certain decisions in our lives that we regret 
and we look back and we just made it because we lost our control of our, of our emotions. Okay, just make it to make stupid decisions. And, uh, you know, I, I remember in the workplace, again, these are, again, growing and learning, where, you know, you'd get upset about certain things, you'd get emotional about certain things, and my manager taught me and said, look, that's fine, but when you make a decision, especially in a workplace, okay, you cannot make a decision based on emotions, okay? It has to be cognitive when you make a decision. It's got to be logical. It's got to be reasonable. It's got to be, uh, you, you, you know, in a workplace when you're working with other employees, it's, you've got to be able to communicate the sense of making that decision. You can't go to your workplace and say, all right, guys, you know, uh, I'm making this decision, I'm making this change because I'm upset. You're not going to convince anybody. <laughs> no one's going to get on board with your decision. But if you're able to use the cognitive sense, conscious, conscious self that you have, and, and you show the reasoning, you show the logic, then you're able to show people why certain things need to change. Okay? And so there, there are different places for, you know, to make decisions in, in, in the right place. But again, you don't want to make a decision based on emotion, you know, if you're overly emotional, because you'll later regret it. Okay? I'm not saying never make a decision based on emotions. If your emotions are in control, if your emotions are in check, yes, it's fine to make decisions on that. Okay? But when they're out of control, do not make decisions. You know, if they're out of control, don't discipline your children while you're emotionally out of control. Get into another room if you need to in the house, cool down, calm down, think about what's taking place, think about what the corrective action should be, then go and sort it out, okay? You don't want to make decisions that you'll later regret. Now, you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I just want to show you that, you know, even when it comes to the Apostle Paul, you know, we've gone through the books of, it, of Corinthians as a church before. We've gone through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. We know that the Corinthian church was really messed up. You know, sometimes people say, oh, but this church has this problem. This church has that problem. Yeah, have you read the book of Corinthians? <laughs> I mean, look, uh, if, 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 if the Lord God is still encouraging the Corinthian church to move on and, and, and recover and push on and serve the Lord, then, you know, there's no reason to just give up on some church because they've got this wrong or that wrong. I mean, some, many times people bring up issues with me about churches and I just think, man, read the Bible and look at all the problems that were in those churches. You know, they're like, it, it's not worth sometimes the, the arguments and conflicts that you create because of this or that situation, okay? But anyway, you've got the Apostle Paul. He's speaking and correcting this Corinthian church. He calls them babes in Christ. He calls them carnal. You know, he says that you're, you know, you, you just love men. You, you're, not, you're, not, you're not people that are trying to serve Jesus Christ, right? You know, they were like, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of, uh, who else? Cephas. You know, they, they, you know they're just men followers. You know, they, they got their, their favorite preachers, and I just, I just got to listen to that one favorite preacher and no one else. And, and Paul's just calling them out, out for their immaturity. And, and of course, you know, that's going to create tension. From the, and sometimes when I preach sermons, right, and I step on your toes a little, I don't intend to step on your toes, I'm, I'm here just to preach the Bible, but sometimes when you're preaching the Word of God, the Bible's a, a mirror as well, it's going to, you know, slap your face a little bit, it's going to step on your toes, and you're going to feel a bit uncomfortable, and you're going to get emotional and, and upset, right? And it can cause tension. It's, I, I've really experienced that. I've really experienced that sometimes just preaching God's Word just causes tension. You know, you don't want to, it just does. And that's what, you know, what the Apostle Paul is going through. He's, he's just trying to correct this church. He obviously loves the church. Obviously, he wants them to do well. He wants them to serve God and, and earn the great rewards in heaven. But there's tension. And when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 11, Paul says to the Corinthian church, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. He says, look, Corinthian church, you know, our heart is enlarged, right? Uh, we, we love you that, that much, right? Well, you know, uh, I, I know I've said some harsh things towards you, but really, we just love the church. You know, we, we care about you. We just want you to go on and serve God. But then look at verse number 12. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straight, straightened in your own bowels. The word straightened there is the word narrow, okay? He's saying, look, my heart is enlarged. He says, your heart toward me it's, it's not enlarged, it's very narrow. There's tension there, okay? They're, they're, they're not, they haven't really enjoyed, you know, what they've been hearing from the Apostle Paul. And, you know, it, it, that idea that it's in your bowels is the other idea of, you know, your, your heart, your, your emotions, right? We often talk about our emotions coming from within. And that's what he's saying. It's like, you know, you've got this tension, you know, you, you don't really love us the way we love you in return. Then he says in verse number 13, Now for our recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, 
be ye also enlarged. He says, look, I, you know, I'm correcting you, I'm speaking to you like you're my own children. Think about how much a parent ought to love their own children. The Apostle Paul says, look, I, I love you like my own children. You know, my heart is enlarged for you. And you know what? In return, your heart ought to be enlarged for me as well, even though there's tension. And brethren, this is the reality of life. You will have tension. You will have conflicts. You will have little arguments with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. You're going to have arguments with your family members, etc., etc. Make sure your heart remains enlarged. You know what? If, if you truly want to just help somebody, if you truly just want to give your opinion for the benefit of others, keep your heart enlarged. Don't narrow it down, even though there's a bit of conflict. Keep it open. Keep your emotions out there, showing people that you care for them, that you, you truly just want to see the best for them. But when you shut down, okay, what's that showing? That you don't want to reconcile. You don't want to learn. You don't want to grow. You don't want to see it from someone else's point of view, okay? And I, I, I just love it when I see these tensions, because then I can say, oh, man, yeah, that's happened for me. <laughs> or that's happened, you can probably say, that's happened with me, you know? I, I've tried to reach out to somebody else. I love them. I just want them to do the best, and, you know, but I've offended them just by trying to be a help, you know? And it happens. You offend people, okay? What? Okay, you've probably been offended, okay? And you know what? When you get offended, what, you know, what's our, what's our millennial generation? Oh, I've been offended, right? Someone has done me wrong. I'm so upset and angry and upset. You shouldn't have offended me. Grow up. You're going to get offended. You're going to get offended, all right? And then you stop and say, why am I offended? Maybe my brother loves me. Maybe my brother has said something that's going to help me and benefit me, and I just didn't like it, but actually his heart is enlarged. He's trying to show me leadership and, and trying to be a support toward me. But I just didn't like what he had to say and I got offended. So what if you got offended? Big deal. Just because you got offended doesn't mean someone has sinned against you. Now, sometimes someone has sinned against you. You might get offended because they've sinned against you. But many times, what I've seen at least, is that people get offended because no one has, no one has sinned against them. They just didn't like someone else's opinion. <laughs> We've all got opinions. You know, and we're not always going to be the same. You know, I'm not trying to develop a church where we have the exact same opinions. I hope we develop a church that has the same goals. I hope we develop a church that has the same love for God and desire for God. But you know what? There are many ways of doing things. If I'm trying to teach you, have the same opinion as me, do everything exactly like me, brethren, I'm not leading you to Jesus Christ. I'm leading you to be a follower of Kevin Sepulveda. I do not want a cult following. I don't want everybody to raise their children the way I raise my children. I don't want all the men to be like me. I don't want all the ladies to be like my wife. Okay? We all have different ways of doing things. This has been a big part of the Perfect Man series. As long as it's consistent with God's Word. And we're looking at our emotions, our affections today. As long as your affections and emotions are within boundaries. They're in control. You're not out of control. Brethren, if your emotions are out of control, give nobody advice. <laughs> okay? Don't give anybody any advice. Go and cool down, go and calm down, and then go and deal with that situation. All right, brethren, let me just end on this point. Well, actually, no, I've got a little things here. Just three things that I think is going to help you have a better control of your emotions. Okay? Now, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can say to me, uh, I have sometimes, I lose control of my emotions. I get overly emotional, I get overly offended, I get overly worried, I become overly fearful, etc., etc., over the wrong things. What can I do to help me? Number one. And this is basic. Know the Bible. Know the Bible. Know what God has to say. Know what God loves. Learn to love what God loves. Know what God, God hates. Learn to love, uh, sorry, learn to hate the things that God hates. Learn what God gets angry about. Don't do then. Once you know what God gets angry about, don't do those things that will get God angry towards you. Know the Bible, okay? Emotions are not wrong. But what you want to do is see how does God look at certain emotions. Fear is not wrong. But don't fear man, fear God, okay? Have the right place where you're going to put those emotions. Anger is not wrong, but being quick to anger is wrong. Being slow to anger is fine, okay? You have to know what the Bible says so you can be in check with your emotions, all right? Number two, and I think this is a problem that uh, a lot of people suffer with. I know because people tell me all the time. You have to get enough sleep. Get enough sleep. Brethren, if you don't get enough sleep you're not going to be in your best emotional state. You know this. You know if you don't get enough sleep, you're, you know, you're, you're discouraged, you, you're lacking energy, you're going to be a little bit more negative in your life, 
you're not going to be effective, you're going to lose focus and concentration, and when, all, when you start to feel all those effects on your body, you're going to start placing your emotions in the wrong place. You're going to be quick to anger, right? If you haven't got enough sleep and something's upset you, you're going to get angry very quickly. Sleep is such an important part of our life. The Bible says in Psalm 127 verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So sometimes we say, well, I've got to remain awake. But listen, yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. We, do, we need to be awake as well. But you know what? The Lord, if the Lord's not going to keep it, there's no point of being awake. You need to get your sleep. Verse number two, it says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. You know what? When you stay up late, you know what? You're going to get into the bad habit of eating the breads of sorrows. I'm so depressed. Life is so sad. I'm not happy with my life. I don't have any friends. No one likes me. You know, I'm despised and this and that. You're going to just get overwhelmed with emotions. God just says, look, get some rest. Get some sleep. You know, God gives out the beloved sleep. Let God watch the city sometimes. You don't always have to be the one awake. What's happening? What's happening? What's... Just, just go and leave it in God's hands. All right? You know, you become fearful and worried and you're like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? COVID, the restrictions, borders, oh, stress, stress, stress. Just, just leave it in God's hands. Okay? There's no point of you being the watchman and, and uh, I better update my brethren right now. Oh, man, there's an update on the... On the what, uh, it's the, now they want a second booster. Better send it quickly to the church chat. Second booster, guys! Get ready for it! Hey, look, just go get some sleep. Relax. Calm down. All right? Just don't wake up. Just leave it in God's hand. You go get some sleep. Okay? Hey, God, I don't know what's going on in this world. It's crazy. <laughs> Lord, I'm going to leave in your hands. I can't, I can't protect the city. If you want to protect the Lord, you do it. I'm going to go get some sleep. Okay? Leave it in God's hands. Get enough sleep. And lastly, the next one that I have is give space for grief and mourning. Give space for grief and mourning. Obviously, when you're experiencing great grief or mourning, you've lost a loved one, for example, you are going to be hypersensitive. You are going to be very, very emotional. Those are the times that you don't want to be making any decisions in life. Those are the times that you need to take some time out, okay? If you, if you work a job, ask your, you know, if you lost someone that you care about, ask your boss for some leave, you know, get, get a week off, get a two weeks off, whatever you need to, okay? Because you're going to be unproductive. You're going to be very emotional about every little thing that happens. And there's nothing wrong with mourning. There's nothing wrong with grief. Very familiar passage to a lot of you. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Then it says in verse number 4, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Reverend, there's a time to weep there's a time to mourn. These are not wrong or sinful emotions, okay? But you've got to give it time. You've got to give it time. And people mourn or weep over a sad situation differently to others. We're not all alike. Some people need more time than others. Some people just respond differently. You know, when someone's going through mourning, don't tell them, hey, you shouldn't be mourning like that. You're getting too emotional. Just let them. They need to get it off their chest. They need to get those emotions out. You've got to give them that time to mourn and to weep. You know, if you find yourself in a very sensitive situation, a very time where you're just weeping and mourning, you need to take time out. That's fine. There's a time for that. Go and relax. Go and, and rest. Don't do anything else because if you go and do something else, even if you go for a drive, you can cause some major, you can do some major mistakes in your life. Okay? You can cause some major damage. Make sure you give space for time and mourning. Now, brethren, if there's someone in our church that's going through a time of weeping or mourning, the Bible says in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Brethren, when someone's going through a great morning in our church, don't go up to them, slap them on the back, ah, get over it. No, <laughs> you know what? Yeah, we'd like to see them get over it. Of course, we want that to be the end product. But if it's premature, okay, they're going to be at, at a highly emotional state, and they're not going to be effective. They're not going to be productive. They're not going to be useful. They're going, you're just helping them make wrong decisions in their life. You know what? When someone's weeping or mourning at church, we come alongside them and we weep with them. We mourn with them. Say, brother, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but, you know, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. You know, if there's anything that I can do, please let me know. Don't just slap on the back. Ah, get over it, brother. You know, you'll be fine tomorrow. You've got to give space for grief and mourning. All right, brethren, in conclusion, in conclusion, when you are experiencing emotions, okay, 
And, you know, again, why are emotions there? Emotions are there to help us make a good decision, to respond in a certain way. But we don't want to respond when our emotions are in check. So in conclusion, number one, when you're going through an emotional time, ask yourself the question, what am I feeling? What kind of emotion am I feeling? Okay. Number two, the next question is, and this comes with knowing your Bible well, number two is, why am I feeling this way? Why am I feeling this way? Again, let's take the example of being offended. Oh, I'm offended. Okay, you're offended. All right, fine. Why are you offended? Oh, because brother so-and-so has a different opinion to me about this or that. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> now, if brother so-and-so has sinned against you, if they've trespassed against you, then, man, that's an issue you need to deal with with them. But listen, if you've just got thin skin, you've got to figure out, man, I'm, I'm feeling very emotional because I've just got thin skin. Well, learn to get some thicker skin. Okay? Develop that part of your life. Instead of getting angry at your brother who offended you because he loves you, okay, go and get some thick skin. All right? I mean, you, but hey, maybe he did trespass against you. Maybe he has done some grave sin against you. Well, now you need to go and, and sort that out with them. Absolutely. But you need to figure out, why am I feeling this way? Again, there's nothing wrong with the feeling, but figure out, why am I feeling this way? So you can make the best decisions moving forward. Next question is, how should I be feeling? Should I be feeling this way? Should I be offended, right? Should I be upset about this? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe there's no reason for me to be upset about this, okay? How should I be feeling? Again, that comes with the Bible knowledge, because you know with, whether your, your feelings are, are aligned with God's Word or whether they're not, all right? And lastly, verse, uh, point number four is, what is the correct action to take? Once you've figured out, okay, I'm feeling this way, uh, you know, yes, uh, I'm lined up with God's word here, I am feeling the right emotions toward the right thing, whatever that is, then what is now the correct action to take? You know what, if you just put these four things into practice, it's going to go a long way to helping you control your emotions. Learn to control your emotions was the title for the sermon this morning. Let me just go through those four things, those four final things once again. Ask yourself the question, what am I feeling? What emotion am I feeling? Number two, why am I feeling this way? Number three, how should I be feeling? And number four, what is the correct action to take? All right, brethren, let's pray.